Do you want to impress your friends with your in-depth knowledge of nodes within Blender? Well, keep watching because this is the video for you. So I've been working on a material nodes course with my friend, Stephen Woods. He's a nodes and general Blender expert. I asked Stephen if he'd share some tips with my YouTube audience, and he came back with some fairly advanced tips on nodes for us to have a look at. So here's Stephen. Thanks, Grant. Hey, Blender and Texture fans. My name is Stephen Woods, and Grant's invited me onto his awesome channel today to share with you some of my favourite procedural texturing tips. These tips are guaranteed to level up your texturing skills. So let's dive in. Now, before we start, I'll do a quick intro tip, if you can call it that, because when I asked Stephen for some great node tips and tricks, he came back with some pretty complex stuff. He's got texture coordinates plugged into maths nodes and they're popping up all over the place, which is great, so prepare for some amazing tips. But for those beginners out there, I'll start you off so you can at least follow along and pick up a few things. So let's jump into Blender. So here I am in Blender, it's 3.64, and it's the basic startup file. Now the first thing if you're working with nodes that you'll really want to have enabled is the Node Wrangler. So come up to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, type in Node, and there's the Node Wrangler, make sure that's ticked. It's worth having Auto Save Preferences on as well, so you can just close this down and the Node Wrangler is now enabled. Then let's go across to the Shading Workspace. I'm just going to bring this window up into this one and this one up into this one, pull this into the middle, and I'll change this one to the 3D viewport. And then we've got the shader editor still over here. So here's our 3D scene. I'm going to select the default cube and delete it, of course. Shift A to add and mesh plane. I'll go to top view, zoom in on that and create a new material for this object. So this is a good starting point when you're playing around with texture coordinates. I'll show you why. I'll zoom out just a touch and move across to the side here and press Shift A to add. Now, if anything Steven's going through, you can't find, remember you've got the search bar up here. So texture coordinates is a good one to start with. And you can see it there already, but if I type in texture CO, you can see there's the texture coordinate node, which I can bring in like this. Now, if I zoom out just a touch and move across so you can see the material output with the Node Wrangler add-on enabled, I can now hold down Control, Shift and left click and that will plug it straight into the material output there. Obviously I'm not seeing anything in my scene because I need to come across the top here and change to material preview mode. And this is what the generated texture coordinates look like if we plug them straight into the surface. Now also if I hold down control shift left click and keep left clicking, I can scroll through these different outputs. And UV is a really common one that's used, so I'll just talk about that for a moment. If we look at our Cartesian coordinates at the top here, we've got Y going upwards in this case, because we're in top view and X going across. And notice the colors that are shown to us is red across the bottom here. And while it's fully red down at the bottom corner here, we've gone one full across the X and zero up in the Y. So we got full red. And notice that's the same as the label here for the X axis is in red. So these colors correspond to the colors up here. If I go full up in the Y or one in the Y and zero in the X, which is this corner, then we get green. So hopefully that will help you visualize what's going on when we start playing with these texture coordinates. If I add a new node, so Shift A to add, and this time I'm going to type in separate, and I want the separate X, Y, Z, or Z, as I would say. And I'm going to bring that over this node here so it plugs it in. So we've got our UVs here, and then they're being separated. And if I Control Shift left click and scroll through these, you can see it gives us different results on our plane over here and it goes from black to white. Black is often represented as zero and white is represented as one. So black being zero light and white being full light. So this node is separating out the X, Y, and Z, and we've just got the X axis visualized here. And of course on our object, X is zero this side and X is one this side. So it goes from black across to white. So just for a moment, think what will happen if I plug in the Y to the surface output. You probably saw it a moment ago, but visualize that anyway. Well, we should expect to see the black here and the white up here and a slow gradient between the two. So control shift left click, there's the black and there's the white. Because we've gone from zero, so the Y is zero here and it's one here. What do you think will happen if I plug in the Z or the Z? Have a quick think. So control shift left click on the separate X, Y, Z and it goes all black. That's because it's flat and it has no number going up in the Z. Therefore it's zero and therefore it's black. So hopefully that mini guide will start you off being able to understand a bit more about what Steven's talking about with his more advanced tips. This is a really must know procedural texturing technique. 
Here we're going to take a brick texture and we're going to distort it to make it a little bit rougher. So first we'll grab our texture coordinate nodes and we'll plug in our generated coordinates. Next what we want to do is we want to mix another value with this vector. So we'll grab a mix color node which we'll set to linear light. Next we're going to grab a noise texture and we'll use the color output from this noise texture to mix into our vectors. Now that's too much distortion, so we'll turn down the factor until we get a level of distortion that we're happy with. Next we can just dial in our scale and then our detail and roughness on the noise texture to get the effect that we're looking for. You can use this technique to distort pretty much any vectors that you want. If you're interested in learning nodes in Blender, then do check out our new Blender Material Nodes Mastery course. It's packed full of exercises to follow along with and lots of challenges in there too, taking you from beginner right through to advanced levels. It's on sale at the fantastically low price of only $10 until the end of the day on Monday. I learned an awful lot whilst I was going through it with Stephen, so I'm sure you will too. Sale coupon in the description. The number one procedural texturing technique that you must know for really good procedural textures is using displacement. In this case I have a plane, I'm going to add a material and then in the properties panel I'm going to change from feature set supported to feature set experimental. Down in the material properties I'm going to change from displacement bump only to displacement and bump. Next what we need is a vector displacement node. We'll plug that directly into displacement and material output. Next we have to add some more geometry onto our material. So we'll go to the add modifier panel, add a subdivision surface, make sure adaptive subdivision is ticked and choose simple so we don't change the overall shape of the geometry. Next we can just add in something like a noise texture, plug the factor into the height of the displacement node and then we can adjust our scale, our detail and our roughness to suit our material. Now in this case I have a lot of tearing on my object so I can increase the amount of subdivisions in the viewport by going to the render panel and scrolling down until I get to subdivision. Here I can change the viewport subdivisions to one pixel however your system might not allow for such high res detail. Now I can see that I have a much more highly detailed object however I have too much detail and too much roughness so I'm going to turn those down to 2 detail and roughness at 0.5. Next the height of my displacement is a little bit high so I'm going to take the scale down to 0.2. Now I'm left with a nice base mesh to start creating a new texture. Now this one reminds me of snow but I could use it to create any material I want. In this tip I'm going to take a whole bunch of different objects, all cubes, and use the object info node to generate a random value between 0 and 1 for each of these objects. In this case let's take an RGB node to give our objects a colour and then let's take a hue saturation node, plug in our colour, plug a random value into our factor and then we can tweak our colour, our hue and our saturation and value to get the right mix of random colours. If you want a little bit more control over mixing your colours you can use a mix color node and choose two specific colors and then use your random value to switch between just those two colors. Now this isn't just limited to randomizing colors. Here we'll add a vector bump map and then we'll add a noise texture which we'll plug into the height and then we'll use a random value and scale. Now each of our cubes has a different scale. We can further control this by using a map range node to dial in the exact range of values we want. Here we want scales between the value of 4 and the value of 10. Using this technique you can randomize any value you want. I'd like to recommend that you use math nodes and gradients generated from the vectors to create interesting shapes. So here I'm going to take a texture coordinate node and I'm going to use the UVs from that because we have a gradient on the X of 0 to 1 and a gradient of Y 0 to 1 and you can see those by using this separate XYZ node. Next we want to manipulate those using math so I'm going to grab an add node and change this over to a less than node and for the threshold we're going to choose a value of 0.8. This creates one area that's black and one area that's white. We can duplicate that 
and use it again, this time using greater than and this time using a value of 0.2. Next we can mix those together using shift control, right click and drag using the node wrangler and we can use a multiply node to add those together. Next we take that whole section, we duplicate it using shift D and this time we plug in the X axis. Now when we mix these two together by duplicating that multiply node again, we now get a square shape. That's not very useful because we can already create square shapes using the brick texture. But if we grab a vector math node and set that to scale, we can scale that cube down to a much smaller size. And then we can take our large gradient, which is now 0 to 10 on each axis, and we can split that up into individual gradients using another math node, this time set to fraction. Now when we look at the result, this gives us a grid of square shapes. However, you can go much further with this. Instead of using less than nodes and greater than nodes, let's choose one of the more complex mathematical functions such as sine. In this case, we get little gradients. If we change all of these nodes over to sine, we get a number of different gradients that actually start to give you almost a curved shape. We can then manipulate that curved shape by adding some value to that vector. In this case, I'm going to add 1 in the x, y and z axes. And I'm going to manipulate that further by adding a mapping node and scaling that up until I get these circular shapes. I can then add a color ramp node, plug that in and change the interpolation type to constant and just move my flag until I get an interesting shape. In this case, I get a grid that has curved edges. You can go much further than this by using much more complex node trees such as this one where I've scaled and fractioned my nodes several times as well as adding a few other interesting vector math nodes and in this case the pattern I got allowed me to mute certain nodes to get other patterns. In some cases these other patterns were much more interesting. I definitely recommend experimenting with this type of technique to create your own individual patterns. So hopefully those tips will help you when using nodes within Blender. Thank you, Stephen, for sharing that with us. And thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.